So uh, we come to our, uh, our third speaker of this, of this session, uh, another of our guests from outside the industry. I'm delighted to welcome designer um, and legend, frankly, uh, of, uh, of, of album design, uh, founder of Microdot, Brian Cannon. Hello, everybody. Um, as you can see, I've been working as a creative in the disciplines of photography, graphic, and design, graphic design and film for 25 years. Wow. And it's obviously uh, an ideas-based profession, but I think possibly one of, if not the best ideas I ever had, was the actual career choice in the first place. And more specifically, when I was 12 years of age, I specifically set out to design album covers. Um, so the next 20 minutes is just going to be my life story from being 12 to 47, where I am now. Uh, what inspired me to get there, and a few stories about what happened on the way. So, the first, oops, and biggest influence ever was this chap, who's possibly the best illustrator I've ever seen in my life. Um, he never made a penny from it though, because he was a coal miner. And uh, that was my father. And when I was probably five or six years of age, he introduced me to drawing and painting and using charcoals and such like. And it just had a massive impact on me. I, mean, I still wasn't considering it as a career then, obviously. I mean, at five years of age, I wanted to be a train driver as it goes. But um, that's when the seeds were sown, and, and I realised very early on I had a, a natural talent for it, and I loved doing it. So the train driver idea went out the window when I was about 11, when I discovered this lot, the Sex Pistols, and um, you're obviously all familiar with them, but for me, it was more than just the music, the fashion, it was more than a political statement, it was bang, the doors were open. Everything had changed, you know, the, the music industry, which had been controlled by massive, massive companies at the time. The whole process was then demystified because the pistols smashed the doors open, as I say, and young working class lads like myself realised, this is actually feasible, this, I could get involved with this now. Um, so initially, at 11, when I heard this, I thought, that's it, I've got to get into this. Picked up a guitar, realised I just didn't have the patience to play it. So the rock star went, idea went out the window. So when I was 12, and there I am, <laughs> I thought, I've got to get into it. So I marry the two disciplines together that I'm good at and I love, i.e. the art and the drawing side of things, and the music. So at that age, I literally said to myself, I want to be an album sleeve designer, designing killer album sleeves for the biggest bands in the world. Um, and quite remarkably, I actually pulled it off. Um, so I did my research, how do I get into it? So obviously I realised I've got to do, go through school, do my A-levels, art college, graphic design degree. Um, and I began my degree in 85. And as a lot of you will know then, because I'm sure you're the same age as me, there's there no computers. Uh, available to students at the time because image manipulation at the time was done via a machine called the Quantel paint box pretty much which cost 150 grand I didn't have 150 grand neither did the college actually for that matter um, so it was all analog stuff we were doing and you can see it's very much punk rock influenced it's all collage work uh, multimedia sticking things down ripping things up photocopied style um, and the point of the exercise, I thought, at degree level, and I was quite disappointed with the course, actually, because I thought you should be able to express and develop ideas, whereas I felt, like, restrained, because, you know, they, they were expecting me to design fish finger packets and wine labels, and I had no interest in it whatsoever. So I'd almost turned it into an open university course and work from home, just doing on my mad shit like this, basically, <laughs> and got threatened with expulsion on several occasions. Um, but I passed in the end, obviously. Um, so the point to all this was just, this is my first bash 
at realising ideas that I had in my head. I thought, this is the first hurdle to overcome. I've got a vision in my mind. How do I physically construct this? Um, and, of course, you know, there was no typesetting machines, nothing. It was all hand-rendered. Everything was hand-rendered, which I think in the long run is a great discipline to have because it's something that stayed with me throughout, throughout my career, even when I became, became digitised and Mac literate. I still work like this now. So, um, I, was, I had this blind self-belief. I have no idea where it came from because I had no track record. I never worked with anybody. certainly never done any record sleeves. And, um, you know, at the end of the, the course, the tutors were like, so what's your plans then? You know, you're going to go and try and get a job in an agency in London? I said, no, no, no. I'm just going to go freelance and do it on my own. I'm like, what are you talking about? You can't possibly do that. You know, you've got no experience. You've got no track record. You've got no equipment. I'm like, no, I know what I'm doing. So I moved to London in 88. And that was the hardware that I had, and I've still got it now. A scalpel, tin of glue, cutting mat and a ruler. And um, guess what? The tutors were right, and I got bugger all work. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I got bugger all work for about two years, as it goes. And, um, but I refused to give in because I thought, well, I haven't got a plan B. There is no plan B. This is what I'm going to do. So. I was scratching around, I was getting bits and bobs of work, but nothing to scream about. And by pure chance at a party in Wigan, funnily enough, I met Richard Ashcroft, who was in a fledgling unsigned band at the time called The Verve. And um, we got chatting, and what do you do? I said, well, I'm designing record sleeves, or trying to. He said, well, that's specifically what you want to do? I said, yeah. He's like, well, that's amazing, because most lads want to be rock stars, footballers, DJs, but you actually set out to be a sleeve designer. I said, yeah, I did. Thought no more of it, and about two years later, I get a message via a mutual friend of ours that they've been signed by Virgin Records, and he wants me to do the artwork. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there is a God, you know. So um, we have a chat about what we're going to do for this first single release. Richard, in turn, informs Virgin Records they're a massive major label, obviously, that this, this guy he's met at a party in Wigan is doing the artwork, so they're like, well, hang on a minute here, <laughs> you know. <laughs> this is a major, major investment for us, and we've got all these other big London agencies lined up for it. So, like, no, 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 I, I trust this guy, I think he's good, he's, he understands us, we've communicated well, and uh, we've discussed it all, and I want him to do it. So I went for the first ever marketing meeting at Virgin Records, and bearing in mind, I'd never worked at an agency. I had no idea about presentation skills, I didn't know what the fuck I was doing, basically. <laughs> and um, the first meeting I ever went to, big marketing meeting, and all you marketing bods don't know what this is like, they all sat on this big boardroom table, and he comes right in, Brian, what's the big idea? Let's see the visuals. And that was it. <laughs> Quite literally. And that was a piece of paper that big, burn in mind. So when they said, like, well, where's the rest of the presentation? He said, no, that's it. So, well, I know what it means, and I know how it's going to look. And I think I was proved right, because the first single looks remarkably like that, actually. <laughs> and you've got to bear in mind, again, that none of this is done digitally, not even shot digitally, it's all on film. Um, the inspiration comes from the lyrics in this particular case, all in the mind, this sort of pea soup, wonder wall, uh, you know, mad image he had in his head. So we all physically constructed this in, the, in Wigan Park that day. Um, but it wasn't as slap shot as I make it sound, obviously, because we know we only get one shot at this, so it was all about research and preparation. So perhaps it was far up front as two weeks before, there was Richard Ashcroft, shot on location, so we could work out exactly how the composition was going to build. And, um, you know, I got the gig then, because they thought, well, he's obviously not a total crackpot, he can do the job. So. Hang on. We move on to the next sleeve. And whilst that was inspired, the idea behind that was the lyrics. The next one was the sound. And this was this huge cacophony of sound this record made. And I don't know where this idea came from, but um, this idea of the, the neon sign in a, on a waterfall with this electric blue water. Now, none of that is done in Photoshop. That's a real neon sign. And you can see the white cables running off to the, the side of the generator powering out a shot. And so blue the water is. I'm stood half a mile upstream with a dustbin full of blue food colouring. <laughs> <laughs> Quite literally. 
and we dyed the river blue. Um, so, but do you know what? I think even if I'd have had the, well, I'll show you some stuff later when I did have the capability to do it digitally. It was just such a laugh doing it, you know. I mean, can you imagine? That, that was in the Snake Pass in Derbyshire. If you look down the valley, the whole of the valley was blue. Um, and just to prove that is a real neon sign, I dropped it at the end of the sheet and smashed it into bits, which is a shame. Um, here's a point, though. I'm not a fine artist, you know, I, I do have to re report to a client. So I might have an idea that I think's out of this world, and yet they might disagree with me, which obviously does me head in now and again, but... This is for perhaps one of the more famous singles, The Drugs Don't Work, it was certainly the first number one. And that's my least favourite verb sleeve that I did. I mean, I did them all in the 90s. Um, I just think it's insipid and it's neither here nor there, it doesn't say anything. And Richard's point was that the visuals I initially provided, who were photographed by John Horsley, who stood over there, sat over there, who would you believe? He thought that the song The Drugs Don't Work is not about narcotics, it's about medicinal drugs, it's about Richard's father who died and the drugs couldn't save his life. And he thought that the ideas that I proposed, which look like that, which I think is a far more interesting cover, apt far much too on the death trip. So that got rejected, which, you know, I was quite upset about, really. Um, now, it's all about ideas, isn't it? I think no matter how good your ideas are, or how talented you are, I think there's always an element of luck involved. And uh, buying these trainers was a good idea. I bought these in Rome in 1990. I took my mother to Rome for her 60th birthday because I'm a nice lad. And, uh, <laughs> and you couldn't get them in England. They're obscure, but you just couldn't get them in England. So I cut to the next scene. I think it was 91, 92. I'm in a lift in Manchester, and this guy gets in. I've not a clue who he is, never seen before in my life. And the first thing he ever said to me was, where the fuck did you get them trainers from? <laughs> and that's how I met him. True story. <laughs> so we're only going up two floors, and he says, well, what are you up to? What do you do then? So I said, I design record covers. What have you done? I've done some for the Verve. Oh, really? I like them. I'm in a band, and when we get signed, I want you to do our covers as well. And true enough, he got signed, and I did everything that Oasis ever released in the 90s. So it's all very well being lucky, but you know, you've, you're only as good as your last job, aren't you? No Gallagher doesn't suffer fools, believe you me. So if I wasn't up to it, I'd have got the sack pretty sharpish. But um, the first thing I did with them was design the logo. Um, the top was a, an embryonic one that we used the Adidas font, more or less. But from a distance, it looked like Usis. So I changed it to the, the Bold Universe font there. But the idea for that came from uh, a meeting I had with the whole of the band, and it's the first time I'd ever met them all together backstage at a gig in Sheffield. Now, I never refer to other record sleeves when designing record sleeves because I think you run the risk of becoming derivative or um, doing pastiches, and I'm certainly not about that. But what I did on this occasion was I took a book full of classic record covers with me just to see where their heads were at, what, where they were coming from, you know, what they liked, what they didn't like. And as I saw that, it hit me like a ton of bricks because if you look back in the 60s, the record company used to put their logo on the front, the Decca logo, it's the label, obviously. And I just thought, if you stripped all that type off, and just had that Decca logo there, but said Oasis instead. Wouldn't that look fantastic? And that's basically how the Oasis logo was born. Um, and nobody picked up on it. I can't believe nobody actually rumbled us for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so again, this, this looks like it's just a fly in the wall shot, but it's a remarkably posed scene, is this? You know, the idea was it's just them relaxing at home, chilling out, there's normal people. It, it's actually one of the guitarist's house. And if you look all around it, it's littered with little um, visual metaphors, if you like, little footballers. The screen, even down to the image, the, the still on the TV screen, that we freeze-framed it on that particular frame. It's a frame from The Good, The Bad, The Ugly, which is Noel's favourite film. You know, picture of Burt Bacharach, who's Noel's favourite songwriter, and so on and so forth. Um, and, like I say, it wasn't just them place. So I sat in that room in virtually every conceivable position for a fortnight before I'm being photographed. And I'd get a sheet of tracing paper and trace myself over and over again into different positions until we built up the collage, sorry, the, the composition. Um, inspiration for it, funnily enough, comes from 
Flemish Renaissance paintings. This is a painting by Jan van Eyck, the Arnulfini wedding. The what's it doesn't look anything like the sleeve itself. The point is, it's down to that little visual metaphors everywhere. It's, it's, there's a narrative to the image, which is what I was trying to get across. Um, again, this, believe it or not, still wasn't done digitally. This was 1994. I didn't get a Mac till 95. Um, so the, 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 the title definitely may be on the front. That's my handwriting, which, as you can see, is I've done it several times, some terribly bad efforts there, I think, as well. But um, um, that was the original artwork that was sent to the printers in the end. Um, so then, you know, it was just a dream project. Can you imagine the budgets were spectacular? The leading times were great. Um, didn't have to deal with anybody other than Noel Gallagher because he was just the head on show, so there was no decision by committee going on. Um, this one was one of the more difficult concepts to actually realise because I was in the tour bus after the gig in Southampton and Noel Gallagher gave me a handwritten sheet of all the lyrics to the song and said, I want you to create an image that illustrates every lyric in the song. I'm like, wow. Um, but it's like, you know, standing at the station in need of education, the sink is full of fishes, she's got dirty dishes on the brain, and so it went. But the most difficult bit was actually finding a picturesque disused railway station. And how we did that was, um, I got a 1930s map of South Derbyshire, covered it with sheets of tracing paper, marked off all the railway stations on it. Took the same sheet and transposed it to a same scale map of the same area, but of current day. And where the exits fell, that there wasn't a railway station. We knew that at some point or other there would have been a railway station there. So we spent a fortnight driving round to all these places. Most of them were just housing estates or whatever, but we stumbled upon that gem. And um, we obviously did what we always do, did loads of test shots. So that's the scene, that's a black and white picture actually, it's been hand painted, would you believe? Um, and oh, there, there's my dad again, over the wheelbarrow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that was the scene before we got, you know, there's, I've always, because I never took any of these pictures. I do my own photography now, but back then I was just directing it. So I, there's all, I, we always just, me and the photographer go along and photograph me on in situ to get a feel of how the composition would break down. Um, so again, that song, that was specifically about the lyrics. There are occasions actually when the sleeve has no reference whatsoever uh, to the record in terms of the music or the lyrics or the feel of it. It's just an image that I liked and uh, the client liked as well. Um, this one was for perhaps the most famous single they ever did, Wonderwall. And, you know, it's, it's obviously a love song about a girl, so there's got to be a girl in it. But the inspiration come from this was, um, I'm a massive fan of Rennie Magritte, you know, the Belgian surrealist. I needed a series of paintings which was an image through an image, creating an image sort of thing. So that, as you can see on that easel there, there's a painting of what's directly outside the window. So that's the kind of idea where that one came from. Um, now, when, <laughs> when they had the idea for this, based on the famous story when Keith Moon drove a Rolls Royce into a swimming pool, I said, please, don't tell me what I think is coming next. You don't want me to actually put a Rolls Royce in a swimming pool here. And so, yeah. Now, you know, everybody knows that Rolls Royces cost a fortune, and even old ones, and even Oasis weren't that rich that they were going to, you know, trash a car. So. But it is a real Rolls Royce, and it really is in that pool. And you've got to bear in mind, by this point, we did have the digital capability to Photoshop that. But we thought, no, we'll do it for real. So the difficult bit, first of all, was finding somebody who had a pool who'd let us put a roller in it. <laughs> <laughs> so we contacted a location finding company and that's actually a hotel in Hertfordshire which was once owned by Victor Lowndes who was the playboy he head man in Europe so it was the wild parties went on there so that kind of fitted with these lot uh, then we, this, this roller itself there's no engine in it the back end's all smashed in it was a scrap roll so we still had to pay a grand to hire it and then I had to get in set builders, basically, drain the pool. And we spent two days positioning that car in that pool. But I think looking back on it, it doesn't look real because it, it looks like it's Photoshop because I think it looks too small. But there's the proof. That car is in that pool. And it was, it was an amazing sight, actually, to be there, to stand and see it, you know. Even though you knew it was 
faked. It just looked amazing. So that's kind of like 98, I think. And lo and behold, I've, set out, I've done what I set out to do, you know, design the best sleeves for the biggest bands in the world. So where do we go from here? Um, so I thought, well, we've done massive bands, I've got massive brands. But I thought there's no point approaching corporate stiff clients who wouldn't get what we were talking about because they just laugh us out the building. So we decided to target brands that I thought whose customers would have been Oasis fans, for example. And it, it worked a treat. Uh, we got loads of work off of Converse, for example. Um, it's like a blind emboss project we did for them. Uh, another cracker that we worked on was for Absolute Vodka. I mean, this is a dream come true, this. <coughs> Not just because of the vodka, obviously, but, you know. Um, but these were, these were new disciplines for me, because everything you'd seen up until now was entirely image-led, all right, with a bit of typography in the, in the corner and whatever, but this is, I'm, by this point, having to really get back into my roots and study typography again. And this, bear in mind, I'm 10 years out of college here. So it's sort of, I had to learn all over again, which was an interesting process, actually. Um, uh, after, yeah, there's another one, you know, same thing. Just that, I really love that simple, clean, Swiss type style. Uh, work with Levi's, you know, these are huge brands and we wouldn't have been able to get in the door because we were just a bunch of idiots from the north as far as most people thought. You know, there's only five of us working together. Um, but because of the kudos afforded us by working with these huge bands, um, we got into these places and you know, in, just interesting projects. Well, this was for the, uh, the Twisted Engineer Jeans, remember them? Um, and this was a press kit sent out in a metal tube, and the idea was it was like an architect's drawings, how they'd ergonomically come up with this plan. Um, so this, you know, so it's all still ongoing, all this, both cl uh, corporate and music work that I do. But another good idea I had, I came up with about a year ago. And this is entirely self um, commissioned, if you like. I do it on my own, and I go out every weekend and I photographically document the Northern Soul scene in the UK and Europe. And apart from anything else, it's a great laugh, but I set up, and I, don't need to, I obviously don't need to tell you the importance of social media and marketing, but I set up a, a Facebook page, not, not me work in general, specifically for this project about a year ago. And it now has 20,000 followers which I think is quite remarkable for a photographic project based on a minority, minority underground interest, if you see what I mean. And it's just basically took off. I just go around, and these are dimly lit clubs playing obscure 60s black music, effectively. And, um, but the amount of work I've got off the back of it because of the exposure it's got is just off the scale. Um, I mean, that, I did that one last week, that was in Aberdeen last weekend, so, you know, I go all over, and it's, you know, it's a labour of love, but I do thoroughly enjoy it. Um, again, that was in Manchester, not so far back. And that kind of takes us to present day, really, and that's me in my studio a couple of weeks ago, photographing myself. Um, so, the, I suppose the point of it all is, you know, I had this mad idea when I was 12. It probably took me till 26 to realise it. I've spent the last 21, year, 21 years doing something that I love and I'm passionate about. So I suppose the moral of the story, if there is one, is if you've got a good idea, stick to it. And that's me done. Thank you.